Hello. So day three, and of all, if you made a list, I'm sure of all the things that you want to talk about and want to hear someone talk about, third party scripts may not be at the top of that list, uh, but stick with me. I think I've got a lot of valuable, useful tools um, and, and, and insight to share. So let's, uh, let's get into it. As Jeffrey said, I work with two of my best friends at Paravel. Uh, we knew each other um, in high school. Dave Rupert wrapped my house with toilet paper, so we go way back. Um, we've been together ever since, uh, with over 11 years now, which is like 100 in web years. Um, but we're going to keep going. I am a web designer. I'm a designer. I like fonts. I love fonts. I had to put myself on a font allowance a few years ago. Things got intense, and I just kept spending, 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 and buying, and buying, and buying. Um, I also love to put those fonts into grids, and if I was like speaking, that's probably where my wheelhouse would be, like layout, um, just you know, how, how to, basically everything that we've heard so far. Um, but uh, something has happened over the past few years as I've been working with clients, delivering projects, prototyping. I've noticed that the things that we build, when they are implemented or shipped, they don't really wind up as intended. So instead today, I'm going to be speaking about third party scripts, third party services, um, because I think that they have a great, a really great impact on the quality of the work that we do. Just to get this out of the way, let's define third parties, or at least what I consider third parties. Uh, any request made by a web page coming from an external URL, a very simple example. Here's my blog. Um, let's pop open a fake web inspector panel. Um, and as you can see, there's two requests from my site, my own domain. Uh, style.css uh, and uh, appropriately titled JavaScript uh, file for myself. Very appropriate, you have no idea. Um, and then another, let's add a third party uh, request here from Typekit. Um, and so just to see what happens there, no third parties, third parties. And that's, I like that though, I'm fine with that when I want to have web fonts running on my site. So we can maybe narrow the scope of this a little bit, just for the sake of this talk. Um, if we wanted to refine, we could say this. Any resource included with the web page that the site owner doesn't explicitly control, uh, you know, there's a bit of subjectivity to what explicitly control means. I feel like, I mean, I, I'm not the keeper of the Typekit servers. I can't control whether it, there's 100% uptime or not. But I get in and I have a kit editor. I can configure things. There's check boxes and I have, like, I can remove them and I know what's going on. And I have a lot of control over the kilobytes and files that are being loaded with my site. So um, let's take two, the same two requests, my JavaScript file, my CSS file, and add maybe like, uh, some other JavaScript file that I may need to embed a video or embed a share button or whatever other kind of service or feature that I'm trying to implement on my site. Um, I don't really know what's in this. This is just me. You guys, I'm sure you know what, uh, you know, everything that's going on, but I'm just like, I just want this video to squish or I just want this bit button to load, so let's just throw this in here. And uh, what I realize, you, you, you realize is that th th this file could change. I don't configure it, I don't own it, I don't host it. It could be deleted, it could be removed. A large company could add some trackers in there and make a bunch of other requests. They almost now have a portal into my website where anything can happen. Um, it doesn't always happen, but sometimes it does. So now I don't have like explicit control over my site and things can get out of hand very, very quickly. Um, I am going to be talking a lot about the concerns that I have around third parties, but they're, they are useful and there's a lot, and so I'll kind of itemize those just to get us started. First off, um, probably pretty obvious, third parties are used to load ads, um, networks to get data around the ads that we're serving and all of these things to make sure we're serving the right ones, um, A-B testing tools, analytics, often tied to ads, but you know, site traffic, trackers, things like that, social media embeds. Um, share buttons, all those kinds of things. This is a third party, but it's also kind of a best practice, but uh, content delivery networks. Uh, customer interaction, live chat widgets, feedback widgets, rate this product widgets that often companies outsource to third parties. Uh, comments. And essential things, uh, like, of course, for me, I would consider fonts to be an essential thing. Um, tag managers, um, you can almost maybe consider those things um, core to the functionality of the site if you know that you're going to be needing them to uh, perform the way that you want. Uh, so there are some benefits uh, that can be used to be data and decision drivers if your site 
is uh, the, the, like a storefront or part of your business, you need to make educated decisions and you want to use things like A-B testing and analytics to inform those decisions obvious enough. Um, income, you serve ads, you get paid when you know, they're viewed or clicked, and uh, you, keep, you keep the lights on, you can generate some income. Uh, to deliver content, uh, you know, if you use jQuery and you're loading that on your site, that can come through a CDN. Lots of times you can host images on a CDN and those are coming from a third party. Um, and then functionality, things that may not make sense for you or the organization that you're working with to build from scratch. You know, if I'm trying to sell uh, clothing online and I'm a medium-sized business and I want to add like a, a rating system or some sort of a feedback mechanism to where people can rate products, like maybe I want to outsource that to a third party. Um, because if building that from scratch would be cost prohibitive and add maybe like a lot of technical debt. And then I have some concerns which we will get into pretty deeply today. The first one comes in the way of user experience and that's like in the way, there's multiple aspects of that. Uh, like poor load time because we are loading more stuff. Um, processor lag, if there's a lot of JavaScript being processed and a lot's going on and you have an, old, an older device or whatever like John Tan was talking about, you know, this could really cause the device to you know, scroll jank and pause and have a really hard time navigating the site. And then also inconsistent UI, if you're outsourcing pieces of your UI like comments or a, uh, like a chat widget or something like that, it could, it, you're kind of now theming it to match the site as best you can. So things can begin to, especially the details, can begin to feel really, really disjointed. And a large piece too is privacy. If we are, you know, adding trackers and getting analytics on our users, there's an aspect that needs to be considered about trust, cons uh, customer trust, organizational reputation, like if something goes wrong and there's a data breach, um, you have to be responsible for that and be proactive about that. Um, so, that kind of initial framing out of the way, uh, let, I want to talk a little bit more about why I, I care this much about third parties and kind of talk about the work that I've been doing over the past years and frame the realization that I've had. So over the years, the things that I have felt responsible for have, have, have expanded. Um, the very, very beginning, I knew a little bit of HTML, thanks to Dave Rupert, and uh, I was like, I'm just gonna make image comps and this is fine, I'll build these and uh, pass it down. But very quickly I realized that my, the things that I was interested in tweaking and improving and building, kind of like Dan outlined yesterday, I wanted to have access to that. So I was like, well, I need to learn some HTML and some CSS and some JavaScript. So I began to expand what I was not, like um, what I felt responsible for, where I wanted to make an impact. And then that just led to, from one thing led to another. Started seeing the impact of the designs that I was building, the images that I was loading, and the techni techniques that I was using to create, to execute my vision on the web. Well, sometimes these things were heavy and I was loading too much, so I started to think about performance. And then I started to think about uh, maximum reach for the designs that I was creating. So whether they were accessible um, um, for, for anyone to access and also whether they were accessible by device size and screen resolution. So I got into accessibility and responsive web design. And then uh, a lot of the projects that I started to work on involved more people. So I realized, realized that there needed to be more communication and more organization. So I started to get into design systems. And then I realized that I need to be able to contribute from the very beginning of the process to the very, very end. So I got into command line. So I can pull up a design, edit it, commit, you know, send. So I'm participating at every phase of the process. Uh, and then recently, I realized that I've been really, really blind. I've had a huge blind spot because I've been focusing on the teams that I work on and a little bit less on the organizations and what happens after I think, I think that my job is done because it's, it's, I'm realizing that it's clearly not. It's clearly not. Because all this boils down to me wanting to have a really large impact um, and do the most I can to help the product, the site, whatever we are building be the best that it possibly can. Because mostly what I deliver these days are prototypes um, with the design team that I have. I love building prototypes, you know, kind of the same process that Dan outlined yesterday where we get in the browser, we start in the browser, and we build all of these things um, thinking about all those aspects that I mentioned earlier. We can, for example, we can simplify an onboarding process for better UX. If we have it in the browser, we can come back to it and we can tweak it and make it better. We can update code, uh, making it more accessible. We can optimize layouts across devices, making our pages more responsive. And then we spend time 
minifying CSS and JavaScript, optimizing images, subsetting fonts, taking out extra characters that we don't need to squeeze out every last byte of savings. It's not as easy as this machine looks, but uh, we've got a process. Um, and we can consolidate all of that work into patterns so that this, this, this is reusable and teams can share and extend from there. We feel really good about this work. It adds up to the manifestation of what the team that I work on believes is the best solution for the problem, the product that we're being tasked with building. And we don't do this in an unrealistic way. We're not thinking about, I mean, we're not, um, we're not we're, we are thinking about slow connection speeds, long words and old browsers. We have support matrix and all of these things. Um, but then I realized that when it's time to hand the prototype over, um, it's, it needs to be integrated or implemented or shipped or whatever that is. And for me, what that, that means is a variety of things. A lot of times it's very, very trivial and something that maybe we already know about and we've already done half the work for anyways, like a CMS integration. We know what's coming up. This was a part of the design and discovery process. We're well aware that this is going to hit. Um, and then things can be moderate. Uh, a lot of times we build sites for news organizations and we know that there's going to be analytics and we know that there's gonna be an ad network. So we sort of think about performance being prepared for a moderate hit on where well, there are going to be more kilobytes loaded with the page because we are going to be loading um, extra advertisements and uh, analytics. But things can begin to get complex when you throw in more and more stuff. But it's common. You throw in a third party A-B testing tools, um, comment systems and payment systems. And in my experience, most recently, there's no limit to how much can be added to a site. There are heaps of third party services with sales teams larger than your design team and development team ready to sell anyone at, the, at an organization on their solution. Um, and it can be discouraging. I find that oftentimes, the, um, all of those optimizations that we make during a prototyping process can greatly outweigh, like, are outweighed by the third-party scripts that are added during integration. So you feel like a hero when you're like, I saved three kilobytes on fonts, 45 kilobytes on this image, and uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and then all of a sudden there's a meg of other stuff that, that you see loading with the pages that you're working on. It's not fun. I mean, oftentimes these aren't added right when the site or the product ships, they're added after the fact. Um, and it's been amazing to me to realize that the, uh, we may spend a week talking about a, a carousel or a banner, a homepage like top tier placement, or the radius of a button or whatever kind of tasks and little design details you might get mired in. But a, a change that would add like a quarter of the page weight to the site can be done just almost like as a site update or a hot fix. Like, well, we need to add another script tag. I just signed a contract with such and such company and we're gonna be doing this promotion and this membership promotion and now we have to add this. I'm not saying that you should never add anything after the fact, but there's not, I'm finding that there's less scrutiny over those decisions than there are kind of maybe some more smaller design details. And these have a massive impact. So here's my realization, finally, it took me a while to get to this, um, that delivering a performant accessible, responsive, scalable website is not enough. I also need to consider the impact of third-party scripts. Regardless of how solid I think my prototype is, it does not absolve me from paying attention to third parties. And I do not think that I'm alone. See this being as kind of a common problem, um, exemplified brilliantly by a Harry Roberts tweet that says, um, this is your website, and then this is your website on tag managers. And if you zoom in just a little bit, even though the graphic is huge, the top little piece, what I take that to mean is the green box at the top are first party requests for the site that he's visiting. And then the rest of the 90% of the requests in the network request panel are third parties. Um, if you're like me, the first time you saw something like this, you may, you may have been wondering like, how is this even possible? Like uh, maybe half and half would be like the most extreme thing that I could imagine. And then maybe, hopefully, the next thing that you think is, well, what can I do about this? How can I prevent this? If this is happening at the organization I work in, work in or the sites that I work on, how can I successfully contribute to maybe changing some of this? 
Um, and speaking from experience, a little bit of admission here, complaining about third parties is nowhere near as effective as developing an expertise and coming to the table with ideas and solutions. So, uh, I, I, you know, in the, my first, when I first started encountering these things and, have, and we'd have team meetings, and we'd be talking about the sites that we were working on, I would make the case to whoever, the client, the, the higher up, a product manager, and just say, we have too many third parties. Look at, the, look at how bad this is. Not specific, not super helpful. It just sort of sounds like, well, Trent's design complaining at me, and I don't, I don't really, he doesn't have any solutions, so no big deal. So it was easy to dismiss. So if I, want to be discussion, if I want to be a part of the discussion around third parties, I needed to develop a broader understanding about them. And so I'm going to share kind of my process for doing that, and I'm going to give you hopefully many, many, many shortcuts, because I definitely is, uh, I did this the long, silly way. So uh, there are going to be broken into six parts. First, we're going to look at the categories and types of third parties. Rather than just saying there's a lot of third parties, we'll, na we'll narrow those down. It'll help, um, it'll help me comprehend them a little bit more and wrap my mind around them, and I think it'll help you. Uh, we'll analyze and itemize third parties. In other words, if you're at a website and you want to figure out quickly, what are the third parties being loaded with this page? Uh, what's the qu quickest way to do it? Which one has the most utility? I'll, I'll present a few ways to do that. Um, also wanted to look at industry averages. Are six third party scripts or services a lot? Or, or 20 a lot? Like what, is, what's, what are the ranges for what other people are doing? Um, want to look at the, like I mentioned earlier, the impact from a user experience perspective, a performance perspective, and a privacy perspective. Um, looking at some of the benefits, why people are using these, and success stories around them. And then finally, just how to practically take action in your organization if you get fired up by this, hopefully. Um, what can you do with the, your peers or your um, managers or higher ups in the, with the organization to convince and develop a, like a unified perception around all of this? So to start with categories, there are heaps of third parties out there, and I needed to gain an introductory understanding. So I wanted just to sort them. I've already shared this list. Um, it's my list, and I think uh, the best way, uh, just looking at a list is helpful, but I think looking at third parties in the context of sites that you happen to be at on a regular basis is much easier than just like sitting down with a spreadsheet or a list of every third party service that's ever been developed ever and trying to memorize it. So there's a lot of contextual knowledge that can happen if you just sort of work this into your daily routine. This is how I did it myself. Ghostery.com is the content blocker that I use. Um, it's a browser, it has a browser extension. Um, uh, just a little caveat to whitelist sites that you love and you want to support. If you go to a, a, a site and they have ads and you value the content, you can whitelist it and allow those ads to come. But I use this, this on a daily basis. I have this installed. And in it, there's a, an expandable panel that comes out of the menu bar. So if you're at a website and you want to know what's going on, it'll show that we all have blocked 33 trackers. And then there is a, on the right, like there's a detailed view and it will list categories. So instead of doing some work away from the web, you can actually just go to any website you want. It'll show you a number of how many you block, and you can dig in. You can expand this uh, panel so that it's not just saying, well, there's five uh, analytics. It will give you the, the names of the services. And you can even click it in even further, and they will describe the services for you. So it's almost like web inspecting for third parties. If you, you, know, if you wanted to know how something was built with CSS and HTML and JavaScript, you can web inspect. You can also do that, um, but I find that this kind of graphical user interface to be a really easy way to quickly do that. Um, and it won't take long to develop your own list. I mean, it doesn't have to be comprehensive, but uh, I think having this kind of working knowledge of uh, what's out there and what, what, uh, what people are using can help you spot things like redundancies and when things aren't, aren't necessary. Um, and so if, you're, if you are browsing and you want to know all of the third parties that are listed on a web page, what's the quickest and easiest way to do it? Um, uh, for me, I came up with a few options. The first one I thought of, uh, which I don't do and I don't recommend, is view source, because oftentimes for me I may have like two or three uh, uh, scripts in the head of, of, a, of a site that I built for myself, but oftentimes it looks more like this, and nobody wants to go through all this trying to itemize and figure it out, so don't do that. That's not a good idea. Um, my second thought for, for doing this was to use Ghostery, but the only problem with that is that I haven't found a way to, to get the information that Ghostery gives you 
out of that ghostry panel. So you can look at it, and maybe you can pull up a website during a meeting and, and, and you know, put your monitor on the screen and show people, but there isn't really a way to do more detailed analysis. So like if I wanted to compare one site to another, I mean, you could have the two windows and you could screenshot the two windows, but there's not a lot of utility there. So I needed this to be easily shareable, easily producible, filterable, sortable, comparable, and all of these things. Ultimately, what I'm saying is I just wanted a spreadsheet, which I think is these days my, the design tool of choice is just building spreadsheets so that I can learn more and show more. Um, say, like I said earlier, saying we have third parties is not anywhere near as compelling as showing volume and mass and real numbers. Show, don't tell. So the first option that you have if you want to itemize scripts on a site that you're working on or, or just a site that you're browsing is to download a HAR file. This is the most work, but it also gives you the most information and it's the most portable. So if you want to go really deep, it's, I'd say if it's a site that you're working on um, and maybe some competitor, competitor sites, it might be worth it to do it this way. Um, a HAR file, HTTP archive format, is a JSON formatted file that logs your web browser's interaction with the site. So save and share with care. Like if you're logged in, there may be some data that's transferred with that as well. Um, but the way you do this is that you would go to any website and you can, this is just kind of a generic uh, representation of it. But uh, you can create a HAR file by going to the network request panel and right clicking and saving as a HAR. Um, and if you're like me, if you get this HAR file, it will save it to your desktop or wherever you want to put it. You have a dot .har. What do you do with this? Now what? And um, if, I, if my network ex uh, request panel um, process confused you, don't worry. You can go to har.tech. It will show you how to download the files. It will explain um, what they are. And it will also give you, and if you're like me, you just, if you, the best, from, it's JSON formatted, so you can do a lot with it. But I want a way to like a graphical, uh, a visual way to explore. So I found uh, there's apps for opening and manipulating uh, HAR files. Uh, I found Charles Proxy uh, at har.tech. It's a Mac app. And here's what a, I think this is slack.com, which is like pretty moderate, it's good. Um, opened up a HAR file from me visiting Slack on my computer. And you can drill in, you can find out if it's like an HTTP one or two request. There's all sorts of information, time to first byte. Um, you could go crazy. But the best part about this is that you can export all of this information as a CSV. So if you want, now for me, this is my happy place. I can filter by domain. Um, so if I want to know how many things are being loaded from Google or DoubleClick, or if I wanted to know how many things are being lo loaded from Facebook with the site, I can do that. Um, I can sort and I can share, I can put it in a, sl a slide deck. I have all of this information at my disposal so I can begin to build my case. Um, and if a visual way would be more helpful, oftentimes if you're in a meeting and you don't want the entire, like a 10 person meeting or whatever, to, to read an entire spreadsheet, doesn't sound too exciting, you can go to requestmap.webperftools.com, built by Simon Hearn. Um, it's, it's now also included in webpagetest.org. There's a tab on the right hand side and it'll kick out one of these in addition to the regular web page test. But this is great, because it just shows some bubbles. Um, for each, you know, the first party and, you know, third party requests. So you sort of now get to get, you sort of begin to gain a, a, a sense of scale and what kind of impact and how massive things can get. This is my site. Um, I probably don't even need the um, uh, uh, jQuery, so I might even just be able to get away with one. Um, but uh, for example here, this is Amazon.com's third party request map, and, or just request map. Um, while it's possible to spend a lot of time analyzing th this in a meeting, the initial reaction I find can go a, a really long way. Um, I've, we, I've done this with clients a lot recently. Just last week, um, we did some um, initial performance analysis on a, a site that we were going to be redesigning, and I just I, I ran their site through um, this tool, and in the meeting just got the most, it was really awesome. They were shocked and horrified. Uh, because it was, it was significantly larger than this. And most of them, even like the engineers, like I had no idea, Who, where, where are all these things? How are we gonna track these things down? We, we don't need half of this stuff. And if you start reading off the requests, a lot of the responses are, I didn't even know this was on the site. Nobody knew this was on the site. Maybe somebody who worked here previously put this on the site and we don't even know where it lives. So things can grow and get out of hand. Um, and if a spreadsheet doesn't do the job, I find that this will. And also from uh, uh, the request map, you can export a CSV as well, if you want that too. 
And then a final option, um, builtwith.com. It's, it's, it's less work, um, but you get some really nice summarized results. It's extremely useful. It doesn't give you web performance insights as much as just show you a summary of what your site has. So for example, it'll show you things like analytics and tracking, widgets, frameworks, content delivery networks, media, JavaScript libraries, um, advertising, CMS implementation, et cetera. So it's even useful beyond third-party scripts. Once I dealt with how to do it, some itemization, I wanted to, to, to expand that work and do a little bit more um, and look into industry averages. So if a site that I work on loads 20 third-party scripts and services, is that a lot? Is that a little? What's normal? So. Uh, First, I thought, let's look at the Alexa top 50 US sites. Um, so I got all of, a list of all of those sites, and I did this analysis for each. Um, I did the US just because I was more familiar with the scripts and services. It was just a little bit easier for me to have a comprehensive understanding of what they were. Um, and a couple caveats, um, t.co is one in there, so that doesn't do anything. And then a few of them are not suitable for work, so I didn't really feel like digging into the I don't even know what kind of third part. Let's not talk about that. Um, so I did the 46 sites. I got the HAR files. I got a spreadsheet. And I made this gigantic spreadsheet. And on, on, on one axis, I had all of the requests that I could find. And on the top, I had all of the 46 sites. And I just put a bunch of check boxes. And this is like, I'm not recommending and saying that you should do this. Um, but I wanted to sort of just do this to, it was almost like a, a just an experience for me to feel the weight of how much stuff is going on. So this was a 9,936 cell spreadsheet that cross-referenced the third parties with the sites, the top 46 sites. Um, uh, yeah, um, so a, a couple summary points. Uh, there were 200 third-party domain URLs uh, among the top 46 sites. You have 46 sites and you have stuff coming to those 46 sites from 213 different places. And I'm not saying that that's re uh, requests. That's just unique uh, places. So there could be multiple requests from the same URL. And uh, there were 22 average per site, um, which may seem like a lot or it may seem like a little. Um, to me, it definitely sounded like, like a lot and more than we probably need. Um, prevalence. Of uh, the third parties, like which third parties appeared the most, were kind of unsurprising. Um, usual suspects like Google, which is like double click in analytics and syndication and ad services, um, Amazon, Facebook, and Adobe, they're everywhere. Um, but there were also sites that I knew nothing about, like Demdex, had no idea what that was. And it was easy to say, okay, well, these sites are loading um, double click and uh, you know, Google ad services. So they're loading ads. I, I know what that means and I, I kind of get a sense of what that is, but I have no idea what Demdex is, so then what do you do? Um, uh, so I started to Google these, and then so you, that, that's a lot of work. How are you going to, if, if I Google Demdex, and then you're trying to check the reliability of the source and know more. I found a really great site that has an index of all third parties, all the ones, all those 213 that I had and more, uh, at better.fyi slash trackers. Um, and there's just an alphabetical index. You can click into them and they'll give you more information on each services. Um, Better is a privacy tool for Safari, but I think it's awesome that they have built this index and share it with everyone. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a lot of work and it represents probably a lot of effort, so I appreciate them for making this public. Um, and what I found with the, the case of Demdex is it's that it's owned by Adobe. So then it started to kind of make sense. I started to make associations for what the services do, what they provide, why they're there, and I was surprised at how important this was for the process, because there were, if you're at a, with the organizations we were working with, I was like, who put this on the site? Do we know what it is? And a lot of people were like, I have no idea. So if we need to decide whether or not we're gonna keep it or remove it, uh, you're gonna have to maybe do some of this legwork yourself. Now let's look at individual sites, how many third parties are loaded with each. Again, these aren't requests. The, uh, these are just unique domains. So it, it excludes multiple requests from the same domain. Um, you can kind of see there's, uh, New York Times has 64. This was done in um, earlier this year, so maybe that number's changed uh, for all of these. Uh, Washington Post has 63. Uh, and then you can kind of see new sites kind of sim similar uh, all the way down, um, and then also a lot of um, e-commerce sites. Um, and then you notice there's some that have like very few. Bank of Ameri America has nine. Chase has 12, LinkedIn 11, surprising. Um, 
Which sites had the most? News sites and shopping sites, I think, have the most from the Alexa top 50. Um, there were other sites that I've, I've found since the, that have more. But it's not surprising to me because it makes sense for both sectors. They need things uh, for types, for um, engagement. They need to use third parties to drive traffic. They need third parties to track like which, which types of articles, for example, might get the most clicks. They need to track which kind of products are getting sold and how, how, how can we market those. So it makes sense that they're using these. Um, but I, think, I do think that in many cases there's a way to optimize and maybe reduce. Um, if you want to read all about this process and um, get access to some of the spreadsheet and all the resources I shared, you can also dig into um, my blog. There's a third parties tag. Uh, and then the next piece. Let's talk about user experience and performance impact of third parties. I think that we feel this, this, I mean, every day when we browse, if you use a content blocker, you probably know and you have that content blocker because the web is hard to navigate, it's hard to use, it's slow to load for you, and you recognize that so you install a content blocker. Um, we feel this any time we use the web. Um, but I'm gonna share one example. Uh, one story, I was at the Food Network, and this isn't to single out the Food Network, because I think sites that I've worked on have, have done the exact same thing. But I went to the Food Network to get a recipe, um, and I saw an, an article popped up, because I had Ghostery, my content blocker, on. And it said, um, we, we hate pop-ups. That's why we don't allow them. We promise the only pop-ups you'll see around here are cake pops. Help us to create a great, con uh, great content for you by turning off your ad blocker for our site. It's easy. We'll show you how. I thought that was a completely reasonable request. I was like, sure, fine. Like, you got me. I'm here at the site. I'm here to consume your content. Uh, you need to load ads. I'm not, I don't need to get this stuff for free. It's fine. Let's do it. And so real quick, before I disable my ad blocker, let's see what happens. Um, I have my ad blocker on and there were 31 requests made, 6.7 megabytes, just kind of anecdotally as I was scrolling around and using the site, it was fine. Like it wasn't, there was no like scroll jank or anything like that. It was a completely usable, totally acceptable um, experience. 6.7 megabytes you could argue is a lot, but let's just not get, let's not get into that right now. Um, turn the content blocker off, reload the page, and I got 348 requests. I have, you know, I'm gainfully employed. I have a 27-inch iMac, uh, you know, all souped up. And it was like choking on the scroll. It was like, are you serious? What are we doing here? 14.7 megabytes, which is a lot. I've seen more. But it was amazing uh, to see the difference. And here's the request map for it. Lots and lots of dots, lots going on, lots of trackers, lots of things that I really don't understand have anything to do with the ad that you want me to, to, to you want to serve me to support your business and the, the article that I want to read about cake pops or whatever I was looking up at the time. And that's what bums me out about all of this is that there's two extremes. Uh, there is no like, just serve me a little bit of this stuff. There's no, there's no slider here. It's you either use an ad blocker or you um, don't and you get a broken, unusable experience. And it's difficult. You can whitelist individual URLs and you can whitelist like, oh, I'll whitelist, like, oh, like I, I've whitelisted things like Typekit. And sometimes with sites that I go to, I'll say, well, if I'm at this publication, uh, I'll, I'll whitelist the entire site or I'll whitelist the ads, these, these third parties that I know are ads. But I've done like a ridiculous amount of work figuring out what all these third parties are. I don't think we can expect users to whitelist our double click and, all, and know what all these things are and granularly do that. It's not gonna happen. And to top it off, I still got a pop-up. And that's why I was enraged enough to put it in the talk. Um, and also, to be fair, I've done the same thing. I've worked on a site. It shipped. Uh, I was really excited. I was like, hey, everybody, we built this. It's so awesome. I'm so proud of the work that we did. And everybody starts like, DMing me and telling, like, emailing me. There is this like, feedback pop-up like, every third time I refresh the page. It's a total like, uh, bummer. But uh, so, so it happens, and I understand that it does. Um, but we can do some more work to prevent it. Um, so another question that I have about this too is does your site depend on third parties to function? I recently noticed this if I have my content blocker up and I know that I know for a fact like the content blockers, the companies and organizations that work on these, they're not trying to just 
let's just blacklist everything and make the site broken, we don't care. They're trying to do it and maintain a, a level of functionality. But if, you, if I go to a, like a, a shopping site and I have third parties blocked and I can't add something to my cart or I can't search for an item because the, the third party script that you use for like recommended search results isn't loading, um, what does that mean? Is that my fault? Or is that, that, uh, the, is that the user's fault or is that the site owner's fault? Um, I can't answer that for you. But uh, I think for me, it's, it's made me start to think a little bit more about the arguments we'll make during meetings talking about browser support matrix. Uh, a common example would be, okay, should we support IE9? That's 0.06% of our traffic, which represents a certain percentage of our income. Is there like a business value for us spending the time and to develop and fix uh, or, do, or, add, or, or the kilobytes to add a polyfill to the site to fix this problem? Um, but if a, a significantly larger number of users are getting a broken experience because they're blocking some of your content, maybe you should add like uh, a content blocked browsers to your support matrix. What happens if, you know, if I go to the site and I can't add anything to my cart because I have a third party content blocker? Or do we expect users to make that connection? Oh yeah, a month ago I installed a content blocker. The site doesn't work. I'll turn the content blocker off and now I can, I don't know if that's gonna happen. Um, so you might see a lot of drop off there. Um, I tried to find like a, like, a, like, a, like a really solid number for how many users, browsers, have a content blocker installed. So I just took one, I took one the, the lowest and the higher, a higher one, um, but I, what I got was a 25 to 40% of US internet users block ads. But I don't think that that's gonna go away, and I think that's number go, that number is going to rise. Noticed a tweet the other day from uh, Firefox. Um, there is a privacy tool built into the browser, but it's, you have to like enable it in settings. They're gonna be switching that on by default. Um, I, and I like that. Not in the sense that I want all third parties to be blocked and, I, and I'm taking the position that no one should use them, but I like that it forces this discussion that I hope that we will be having about the, 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 the two extremes. Um, you know, are we gonna force our users to block our third parties so that they can use our site? Or are we going to like just bombard them with whatever we want if they have the content blocker disabled? What's a sensible average here? How can we um, optimize and design for third parties in a way that makes the, like the things that a business and an organization needs to do to function and can give the users what they want? How can we do this in a more sustainable way? Um, Next, privacy. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I think I, uh, just a little preface, I think this could probably be its own conference or its own talk, certainly, um, but I'm gonna summarize a few things and point you in a few places um, because I do think that this is really, really important. We've all seen this. We see this more and more, now, yeah, now that uh, like GDPR is in place. It's something that I brush aside all the time. I don't give it a second thought. I'm like, I'm here for my cake pop recipe, or whatever it is, let's just click it and go. Um, we're using cookies. It becomes second nature. It's just a part of browsing the web. Uh, Jason Fried has a really good tweet about this. Maybe we should rename cookies to trackers and you'd see some progress. Who wouldn't want to accept cookies, but has anyone ever turned down a delicious cookie, but, but would you want to accept a tracker? And we can, it's easy for me to complete, re completely re disregard the, implement uh, the implication of this uh, when I'm browsing a site and I'm just after content, and it's just this little bitty thing I want, you know, and sometimes I don't even close them out because they're oftentimes pretty small at the bottom of a window. But then creepy stuff happens. Uh, remarketing. Remarketing, if you don't know what it is, I, I recently learned what it is, even though I know I've, ex I've experienced it. It's that thing when you go to shop for a spatula. And you probably even buy the spatula. You check out, the spatula is on its way to your house. You have given the organization money and then you go to the weather app and it tries to sell you the same darn spatula. Everywhere you go, more spatulas. I got three spatulas, I got an egg fork, I've got all sorts of cooking utensils, I don't need any more of this stuff. Maybe a pan, but it doesn't happen. Remarketing is everywhere and I think that it's like kind of harmless. Like it's kind of cute, like oh, computer, good job. Like you, you figured it out, you, you track me on my phone from Amazon to the weather channel, that's cool. Um, it does work as a caveat. Uh, talk to a lot of people and they say, yeah, yeah, it's annoying and kind of silly, but it's, we sell a lot of stuff with this. So it's maybe here to stay. Um, but what I'm figuring out and what I've realized in some of this research is that uh, 
like whether or not I get recommended a third Panini press by the Weather Channel is there's that's maybe a, one problem, but um, there's other things that uh, we we can encounter when we're browsing that can be a little more intense and a little more sig significant. I find now that um, you know whether or not I get a a Panini press is a lot, lot trivial compared to some of the more intense, um, serious issues that we have in terms of uh, privacy. And I think that this is true. Web builders, we're often on the front lines. It's up to us to be proactive and advocate for the best practices with privacy and data protection, um, just as we did with web standards or accessibility. Um, these things are... Uh, Oftentimes there's no, like, I, I get this a lot, like there's no business incentive to be the first to market with a performant ad advertising like network or an advertising strategy. Or, like there's no business um, decision for us to, 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 to take like privacy into this much of an account unless we're going to get sued. So let's just do the minimum. If you're designing an interface and are building something and you, have, you think that something's questionable, um, I encourage you to, uh, to, to, to raise your voice about it. Because, because I think that, um, because we are on the front lines, I think that uh, w this is what makes me proud to be a part of the industry. Uh, so, you know, anyways, uh, continue to do that. And if you do see something, I encourage you to, uh, to speak up. Don't wait to be told to, to remove something. See if you can raise the case yourself. And I think this is so important that I could probably now add another uh, radius to my areas of like, responsibility or that are thing, th of things that I think are important. Um, so uh, a few specific tips. Um, GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation. Heather Burns writes and speaks about privacy a lot. Um, she's given a great introduction to GDPR with a, an article on Smashing Magazine. Um, and note that these privacy Im impact standards, they have a global impact. So um, if this is, if you, have, if you are a uh, site or a business based in the United States and you have, and you have users in Europe uh, and you are not um, adhering to these standards, then you are subject to, um, you know, uh, being sued or uh, targeted. Um, next. There's an article that she wrote uh, on privacy by design. Privacy by, de by design is a framework that can help you prevent privacy issues before they incur, uh, occur, encouraging transparency, um, trans uh, proactiveness, and end-to-end -end coverage. A few examples there, it's just sort of like, they're kind of general, but they're common sense things that you can use to discuss in a meeting. It's like, um, what do we do if somebody creates account, an account, and what happens when they delete their account? Where does their data go? All those kinds of things. So it sort of gives you like the default um, uh, approach when you're um, building, don't ask for things like, if, like what's your address if you're not going to use it and if you don't absolutely need it for your app or business or site to function. Don't ask for your birthday if you don't need that. Just get the minimum that you need um, as opposed to just let's, let's get all the data that we can and then we'll figure out where we're going to store it and how we're going to be responsible for it later. Not the way to build. Um, and then finally, you can run a privacy impact assessment, which is oftentimes the first thing that we do with clients. Um, when, we, when third parties come up. And what that is, it's, uh, there's an example linked here, but it's like 30 questions or so that uh, almost helps you to get, gain an understanding within your organization for what you're doing with data. Like the, the, some examples, where is data stored? Is it stored locally? How many, you know, is it backed up? Where, is, where does it live? How many places does it live? Um, what do you do, like I, I said earlier, what do you do when somebody deletes their account? All of these questions that sort of gain and under, help you gain an understanding for what you were doing um, within term, like in terms of users' data. And it will help you get your privacy ducks in a row. Um, so I ha obviously have a bit of an ax to grind, a performance ax, a user experience ax uh, in, in terms of third parties, but I wanted to understand some of the benefits. Like practically I get it, but I wanted to talk to, to uh, some friends of mine that, that use these and implement these and work with clients uh, on a daily basis and to hear kind of like how, how are these effective. Um, because two people can look at the site and see very different things. I may see a user experience hit, and another person may see a key money maker or a decision driver, something that they absolutely need to do their job within the organization. Um, so we need to come together. And thankfully, Matt Weinberg, who works at Vector Media Group, volunteered his time and Lee Goldberg's time to walk me through how they use tag managers for the businesses, the clients that they work with. Um, 
And for me, when he was like, Trent, so what do you think about when you hear Tag Manager? And I was like, well, I imagine a funnel that you put the, in the top of your website that allows you to cram even more third parties into that site. Um, but that, fair or unfair, this is actually what a Tag Manager looks like. This is a Google Tag Manager, and it's just like a dashboard. And you can go to the dashboard, sign up for an account, and it will give you some code snippets. You copy the scripts. For, for, from here to the head and the body tags of your layout file or your HTML document, like this. And then all of a sudden, you can go back to this dashboard and you can add any number of scripts or services you want. One tag injected will just basically open the door and you can add more, 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 more. And without touching the, any kind of code, without deploying anything, all from the convenience of a dashboard. The first concern that I had about, I have about uh, tag managers is it's sort of like Pandora's box. Um, I think I sometimes forget how nice it is to be able to build and contribute to the web myself. Like I can ship updates, I can make design changes, I can use GitHub, I can deploy, I can blah, blah, blah. I can do all this stuff and it's fun. There's a lot of people that work in, with companies that I work with and they have no access to the web. They have to ask somebody else, they have to go through a process, they have to get a change order, there's probably gonna be a meeting and a debate, so why don't I just go to Tag Manager and add the script that I need and get what I want really, really quickly. Um, going back to Harry Roberts' tweet, this is what you'd get. Um, but Vector's experience was different, and I began to realize that the way that they approach third parties is the way that I need to be approaching third parties. What they, what they saw as, um, what I saw as a problem, they saw as an opportunity. We can now declare, let's only put third, any third parties that we, we do, we add, let's put them in the tag manager. That way, we have an automatic inventory of all the third parties that are being loaded, whether it's like a font, an ad, or analytics, A-B testing, whatever, they're all here. Because if you don't do that, you're gonna, and, you're, and you're not super organized with your layout files, you may be looking through a code base trying to find um, a script that you're trying to remove. What happens if that script blocks content of the page and something goes down and nobody can find it, the, pay, the site's not loading, we're losing um, time and money and all these things, we're on red alert and we don't know what's going on. So it helps to uh, just get things organized. And um, it also unifies control. If, um, I, you know, if, if I can see where everything is, we can have a meeting and we can, look, we can go through and look and decide you know, what, what's redundant, what can we get rid of, what do we need or what do we not, not need. And they actually said that anecdotally, they saw that load times go down because they, they'll, they'll, as they're putting everything together, people point out things like, this is redundant, we don't need this anymore. I have no idea why this is here, et cetera. Lee pointed something out. An analytic strategy should be part of the initial development and design process, which really got me thinking and made me realize that those prototypes that I was ex like describing earlier, I wasn't really doing, if, I'm, if I care about third parties and if I think this is a thing, that needs to be a part of the prototyping process. I need, to get it in, I need to get into it from the beginning and the way that they work is they'll reach out during the discovery from the very beginning and ask the client, what third parties are you using? How are you, um, what, do you what, are they, what do they need for? What are your business goals? And that's a part of the site design process from the very beginning. Designers are involved. How are these things gonna load? What kind of performance impact is there gonna be? How can we design to make sure that these things look as good as they possibly can if there's a UI component to them? And if done properly, they made the case and I think I believe them, that uh, the disproportionate weight and degradation that I talked about earlier can begin to be balanced out. And that's very, very encouraging. The next thing that I talked about and I hinted to earlier was that it's so easy to add scripts. I mean, look at this, this is a lot, there's a lot of appeal here. I'm looking, I'm just gonna start searching for some scripts. It's like shopping, it's like a kid in a candy store. Oh, let's add some analytics, drop it in, add tag, save, done. And I'm, I'm updating the site and I'm changing the site. And it's important, and I think during the, the way that they steer clients during meetings and reviews, uh, Matt Weinberg said this, we work towards a global maximum versus a local maximum. Small hyper-focused changes may seem good at the time, but we have to be mindful of the overall quality of the user experience and the integrity of the brand. And so a lot of the things that I notice, third parties need to be added, a lot of times they're very, very small. Just last week I was on a call with, with a remote client and uh, there were a few other people and somebody that I'd never heard on this kind of stand-up call before just, hey everybody, how you doing? Um, I have a script I need to add for, we just signed a contract with such and such. Um, 
we need this functionality for a promotion we're going to do over Halloween, drop the script in, and somebody was like, okay, fine, and then the call was over, and I was just sort of like, oh, man, we have to fix this. This is going to be a problem. And I wrote, I mean, the least I could do is write it down and say, well, in, you know, in November, we're going to go through and remove this. But if I, was, if I hadn't, didn't happen to be on the call, there's just another one to the pile. And so there was no discussion about, well, what can we remove? Do we have anything else from the past, other holiday promotions that we can remove so that we don't have, we're, not, we're not piling these things up? Um, so you all have to kind of be, have a comprehensive, uh, broad view of everything. Um, during the call, and this is the thing that I started to really get convinced by, and they walked me through one client's success story after another, and it was compelling. They were citing things like increased sales and conversions for a business, um, and results like these are hard to argue with. And I think that there are two hats that I'm speaking from here, because if, you know, as a web um, user and a web designer, I think about the way I want the web to be and what I, you know, I, what I hope for it to be. But then I th also think about clients with very specific goals and, and, and they, you know, they need to succeed online, they need to make money, and I'm here to help them succeed. So it's one of those deals where it's like, well, I don't want any of you to use as third parties. Like, y'all should just use none, and I'll maybe use like five or ten, um, and then the web will be fine because, you know, you, you make up for my uh, penalty there. But um, these are hard to argue with, uh, but I, what I realized ultimately in the call is that you shouldn't blame the tool, it's the way that you're using it. Um, so, I think that Harry Roberts raises a really good point with the Tag Manager tweet, but I think that you can also use it to your advantage by being open and communicative about how they are included. Um, wrapping this up here, what can we do to make Tag Manager usage and third-party script inclusion successful and sensible? Um, first, I think, is to put standards and people in place to maintain quality while implementing third parties. Um, you can write those standards out. Here's just some examples that I made up. Determine the value to the business and the website. So if I have a new script I want to add for a holiday promotion, I have to say, well, this is going to help us you know, have more sales, or this is going to impact the business in this way, or we need this functionality for wh whatever. But you shouldn't, you know, you need to make a business case or an organizational case for why you want or your department or your team wants to add a third-party script. Of, oh, uh, avoid redundant scripts. And services, so if you're adding something, make sure that there's not something there that's already doing that job. I've seen a lot of sites with multiple, multiple, multiple trackers and um, analytics to, uh, scripts on them. Um, fit within established performance budget. If you have a performance budget, if you don't, I encourage you to do that. Um, you can check into some of Tim Cadillac's writing about it, but uh, um, you know, if, if, if it violates a certain kilobyte limit that you're trying to target for a page, that facilitates a discussion. What are we going to remove? to make room for this, or are we going to um, knowingly raise the uh, kilobyte limit to the page that we're building? And then make sure it complies with organizational, your organizational privacy policy. Um, document those standards. We put things in style guides and design systems um, that talk about styles, components. Sometimes I see things that I love, like uh, voice and content, uh, tone, performance notes. Why not have a third-party section where you, you, within your organization, can upload maybe via the HAR file or a spreadsheet or however you want to do it, but maybe you create a table that itemizes all of the third parties that you're loading on your site um, so that you know, maybe you have a quarterly review where you can say, these are what we're loading, do we need all of these, what, what's gone away? Um, basically just making sure that everybody can see the same information and share your perception. Um, and then um, include scripts uh, during your prototyping process, so performance tests and UX feel is accurate during the build process. Um, at least, or if, and if you can't do that early on, maybe you don't have access to the scripts or you don't want to mix up the data, like at least document a plan for how that's going to fit within your performance budget. Um, audit third parties. Um, you can begin to do this, I think, like every three months would make, a sen would make sense. Sometimes like an optimized list can help, um, but you could go through and generate a report for meetings and have action items and be on the far left. Like, a oh, well, this one is uh, larger than we budgeted for, so that's a, we have a performance budget issue. And then, oh, we have maximizer and optimizer. We do not need two A-B testing tools, so this one now is redundant. So you can go through and just have a quick meeting and you know, clean up as, you, as necessary. What I also like is signing up for a performance monitor so that if the, somebody is using a tag manager, and they sneak in late at night and they add a script that's super, super heavy, and all of a sudden your, your page load doubles, your, pay, your file size doubles, you can track that and limit that. Um, and then make a business case. And um, what do you do when you're ready to talk like, to your leadership or to um, 
management there. Like instead of, you know, a lot of the examples that I shared earlier are more about like convincing your coworkers and your collaborators. How do you make a case to leadership? My favorite thing to do here is a competitive analysis. So you could say, well, our site loads 12 third parties. We have 39 HTTP, HTTP requests on our homepage. It's 1.2 megabytes. Um, let's say I work at Adidas. And then, okay, well, Nike does this and Reebok does that. Well, they have fewer, so what can we do? And oftentimes, just that sheer competitive um, drive within most people, it's like, well, oh, what can we do to get down? How can we be the best in class at, at this? Um, also, I like to make slide decks, so I put that in slide decks, um, share it in meetings with executives, um, gather compelling results. I love going to web performance optimization stats, WPOstats.com. Here's one that I use quite a bit. Uh, the BBC has seen that they lose an additional 10% of users for every additional second it takes for a site to load, so that you can begin to get some, some sort of sense for like what this script in question is doing and how it's penalizing users and maybe how it's penalizing the business um, in terms of income or revenue. Um, and then also you can get some very specific comparative data by using webpagetest.org. If you have a script that you want to make a case for it being removed, you can go to webpagetest, enter in your URL, hit uh, submit, and it'll generate a result showing you what the uh, page load experience looks like, how quick things are. Um, and you would get those results, and you would go back to webpagetest, and there is a tab here that's uh, a block tab, and heaven forbid if I block fonts, but if I go to, if I'm using my site and I wanna block everything from Typekit so that I know now what my site looks like loading with Typekit and without. So now that we have very specific numbers, I'm not just saying we have a lot of third parties, it's like if we remove this, we can save X number of kilobytes, we can save X number of uh, like milliseconds in a page load, and then maybe we know that will equate to X dollars in impact to the uh, business. I mean, if you use real user monitoring tools, these, can get, these numbers can get very, very exact and very specific. Um, real user monitoring tools are analytics tools that help correlate performance to user experience and business metrics like conversions or revenue. So you could get those results, plug them into RUM tools, and instead of trying to make the, the last little leap yourself, you can see a dollar value impact to the business, and there you have it. And then it has a very specific numbers, very specific amounts tied to the discussion about whether or not we really value, we really need um, the third party in question. And finally, with a newfound perspective around third parties, um, I think working to maintain an ongoing discussion that includes the entire team so that pros and cons can be weighed. Um, after all, as Tim Cadillac says, everything should have a value because everything has a cost. Whether it's CDN uh, hosting bills, reduced traffic because of slow pages or high bounce rate because of processor lag, everything we add to the page has a cost, so we need scrutiny and debate to make the best collective decision around third parties. So let's do that. Thank you very much. So I have slides, links, people to follow. Oh, sorry, yeah, people, these people help me. Like, uh, back to kind of what Jason was saying earlier. Andy Davies, Simon Hearn, Matt Weinberg, Lee Goldberg, Harry Roberts, Errol Barkin. Um, Laura Callbag and Dave Rupert reached out to them with specific questions, got specific answers. I love the web community because about a year ago I knew nothing about this. I know quite a bit about it now, and it wouldn't have happened if people weren't so generous with their information and time, so I love that. Uh, links, tools that I mentioned are all in the slide deck. There we go, thanks, appreciate it.